hello, piano friends. Today we're talking about how to teach Puck or Little Troll from the lyric pieces by Edvard Grieg. It sounds like this. This is a student favorite. It's of course very fast and it's in a minor key, which a lot of my students prefer. And it's programmatic. Pro programmatic just means it tells a story. We have music that doesn't even have lyrics or an actual story that evokes in our minds a clear picture and we can imagine, or you could picture putting this to film and it could be the soundtrack for something going along there. If we haven't met before, my name is Jana Williamson and welcome to my home piano studio in the suburbs of Chicago. I do have two other teaching videos on other pieces by Grieg from the lyric pieces, including Watchman's Song and Sailor's Song. So be sure to click up there or in the description of this video to check those out as well. Grieg wrote so many wonderful pieces for piano students of a variety of levels. He of course wrote wonderful advanced music as well, the concerto being one of the main examples of that, but he wrote a lot of great intermediate music as well. So the title of this piece is actually a little bit interesting. The original title can be best translated in English to Little Troll, and I am looking at this today in the Festival Collection Book 6, and that is how Helen Marley has translated it. But in many other editions, you see this labeled as Puck, uh, which would be the character from Midsummer Night's Dream, who is a little bit sneaky and not always doing good things. Regardless, if you're thinking of a little troll or Puck, it should sound ominous and sneaky and have um, mischievous or up to no good kind of character to it. Beyond that, I think you and your students can think about exactly what's happening in the story here. I did try to do a little digging on where the title Puck came from and I got no results. So if you have ever heard a good reason as to why that was put into English as Puck, please leave a comment in the comments of this video. I would love to know if you have thoughts on that. Sometimes teachers struggle to know exactly how difficult an individual piece of repertoire will be for their students. Unless you've had a lot of teaching experience, this can be quite tricky. And this is an example of a piece that in some ways is easy and in some ways is quite hard. So if you'd like help in learning how to evaluate just how hard a piece is, go into the description of this video and get a link to download my free repertoire difficulty worksheet. I know you'll find it helpful for evaluating your student's next prospective piece of repertoire. All right, so our students have a lot of work to do in order to play this piece fast. And if they listen to professional recordings, it will go very fast. Um, so I would just caution your students, if they do go listen to a professional recording, make sure you even just say something to them. Or if you listen to a recording in your lesson, or if you demonstrate uh, that if they are a intermediate student, they do not have to play as fast as a professional to still have a successful performance of this piece. Beyond the tempo, we're in E flat minor, which is a key that at this level, your students probably do not have much experience with. Now, the nice thing is that E flat natural minor is actually a pretty comfortable key and everything is flat besides the Fs. So you can default to playing everything flat. Now that said, I think the problem with this piece is remembering the C flats. C flats can be problematic for students because they just don't look like a black key, as well as the number of accidentals that Grieg included in this. There is a whole lot of chromatic movement. We can see that from all these chords that are moving through, such as in measure 23. Those top notes, of course, are just moving down by half step. And if you add the left hand, it also moves by half steps. I'll just play the outside. And that's sequenced over and over and over again through that middle section. We also get a true full chromatic scale uh, in the left hand beginning in measure 53. So the right hand plays the B flat. finally lands on the E flat again down low to return to the A section. 
So hopefully this is not your student's first experience with a chromatic scale. They should have done many chromatic scales before this point and just know a chromatic scale fingering. Uh, but any good addition will give you that fingering in there as well to help your students. I do think students should be reading this on the one hand. On the other hand, I do think you can teach a little bit of this by rote or at least by pointing out what it should sound like that we should be hearing all of that half step movement and that should sound just like measure 27 and on from there because if they have any trouble with the accidentals, they might get so caught up in it that they're not actually listening for that chromatic movement and they have to hear it correctly. It is helpful to note that those inside notes, the bottom of the right hand, which at this point is just the D and the F, do not change for each of those little sets. So once you get yourself set up for the first chord, you're okay. You could even then try to block out finding all those first chords. So pick up to 23 and then pick up to 27 and then pick up to 29 and continuing on from there, you could go through those so that they have memorized exactly what the next one is that they're going to, because again, there's just so many accidentals. It can be a little bit overwhelming um, as far as you know, thinking about where you're going and what note you're supposed to be playing. I'm not gonna go into a deep theoretical analysis on this because I don't think it's actually appropriate for students at this level. I don't need them to understand everything that's happening, but I do think it is worth pointing out to our students we're in E flat minor, and then Grieg somehow through all that chromatic movement gets us to C major in measure 37, which is a terribly remote key from E flat minor. Those t keys do not go together. And so that's very, very remote. And then he somehow takes you up to E major and then just uses the tritone from E with that, then that chromatic scale, which I just talked about, to take you back to E flat minor. So there's just a couple of theoretical concepts in there that I mentioned, you know, what key we're hanging around, what we're tonicizing, the idea of a tritone, which is a very interesting interval, and then that chromatic scale to take you back down. That can give even a student who has very little theoretical knowledge a great appreciation for how wacky this gets. And that can help us think then, ultimately, why it sounds so ominous and you know, what makes it exciting and unsettled and the, how you really feel good when you get, get back to E flat minor. Speaking of chords, it is helpful to note this is in somewhat of a sonata type form in that the first A section starts in E flat minor, but then ends on the B flat. So that would be the dominant but Grieg does things differently on the repeat of the A section. Again, you start in E flat minor, but then through what he takes you through with the C flats, that's measure 70, 71, he then ends it in the correct key in E flat minor. And the last thing I'll just say about accidentals is that there are a few F flats. So well, as we're thinking in the key F natural most of the time, and C flats, which is a white key, there are just a couple of F flats. So it is important that your students are just very, very clear on the idea of C flat and F flat and clear on when they're supposed to use what in this piece. So like I said, your students are gonna want to play this fast. Everybody likes to play fast, likes to play you know things that are very impressive and all that. And that does lead us to a fingering question. In a second, I'm gonna to switch to an overhead camera, but just to say, when you look at different editions, you will see different fingering choices. The main one being with your thumb on E flat and then later on A flat. Or should you do something where you're kind of pivoting around? So I'll show you that in just a minute. The other technical spot that's difficult to play at a very fast speed is the end of those A sections. So this, which I do think should have pedal, it can be very difficult for students to just travel across that much space that quickly. So I like to have them block it so they can feel the chunks just boop, 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 going up the keyboard. And then we might do a sprint to the place where you change like that. Trying not to accent the thumb like it, I just made it sound just now, um, but just getting there very quickly with a totally horizontal movement, not doing a lot of arc you know, up and down. And I would probably 
also teach this with just hitting the top B flat at the end as opposed to the uh, octave with the fifth in the middle. And then later you can add the octave and then you can add the fifth in at the end. There has to be just a tiny little lift to replay the F right there. And the exact same thing applies to the E flat. Now do note when you're in E flat that it's all black keys. I think in some ways that's a little bit easier than getting your thumb, sorry, your two into the F there. Uh, but you know, your student might feel differently about that. So do spend some time working that out. So let's talk about fingering. Many students, when they see this pattern, will be tempted to use a positional approach and put their thumb on E flat. And you do see this recommended in some editions. Uh, what Marley has in the Festival Collection is a fingering that I find far superior, and that is to start with your two on E flat and pivot around your thumb. I think that's so much easier to be clean and clear. It's a little harder though at measure seven. She has two, three, one, and then five on top. I find that to be quite tricky to coordinate, especially with my left hand, but I still think it's cleaner than putting my thumb. It's hard to get your three onto that C flat. So those are your two main choices. Now when you get to these parts, you really do have to just use your thumb. There's not a lot of other options and it's so sequenced that it makes sense to be in that, you know, G flat major, D flat major positional place. Uh, but the other fingering is worth really thinking about. I do want to mention that there is one rhythmic place that sometimes throws students if their initial understanding of the meter is not quite correct. If you look at measure 15, there is a pickup to it, meaning that the A flat is what's on the downbeat. And in fact, there are accents on the downbeat right there and the middle of the measure as well. But many times my students have in their head for some reason the reverse, which is that this is the downbeat. So they need to be very clear that this is a and a one, and a one in, two in, one in, two in, so that then the full measure rest in measure 17 can be correct and the next measure can be correct as well. So if I do that in slow motion, it's and a one, two, one, two, one, two, two, one. I can't tell you how many times I've taught this and for some reason students reverse the meter in their head. So the next time I teach this, I'm gonna be very sure to start with that and help them step on the beat or do something to feel where the downbeat is there. It should probably go without saying that there are a lot of drastic dynamic changes in this piece, of course, to make it very dramatic and you know fun and mischievous and sneaking around. So yes, your students need to develop a very light touch for the piano sections and they need to be prepared to really just drop their arm weight and move very quickly with a nice good attack anytime that it's actually forte. In the B section, you have a lot of these little hairpins and crescendos back and forth to really make it sound like something dramatic is about to happen. That's what really brings this to life and you can combine that with some storytelling and imagery ideas with your student to really have fun with this. I hope that's giving you a few good ideas on how to teach Little Troll by Edvard Grieg. Don't forget to check out my other videos featuring pieces by Grieg. If you have other pieces from the intermediate level that you'd like me to cover, please leave a comment below. And I wish you all the best in your teaching.